Welcome, everyone. Hey, Dylan. Hi, Rachel. Rachel, can you put your camera on? Do you know how to? There should be a button right below that says turn on video. I think Dylan figured it out. Do you want to turn the video on? Rachel? Okay. All right. Well, let's start. Hi, Dylan. Good to see you. Hi, Kunal. I, Great I to see you as well. I don't know what happened to the tech. Usually, how this was supposed to work was, you know, it would bring on two speakers, and then the other speakers would be to a side on a small screen. But I guess we're going to have to talk to the gods in Airmeet, aka the founders, and figure out what went wrong. But it's just a design issue. But thank you for being here. And um, oh, yeah, good. and yeah. So. So Dylan, I, I would love uh, to first and foremost uh, introduce you as one of the pioneers in space investment for private space travel, as well as someone that's done so much for humanity to democratize the idea of space. I'd love for you to start with your origin story and tell us the story of you know space for humanity. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, essentially it started with a fellowship at the Aspen Institute uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a think tank based in <clears throat> Washington, D.C., quite influential in policy in the U.S. And essentially, they have a fellowship program called the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. And I was honored to be selected as one of the fellows back in 2014. As part of that fellowship, you have to pick a big, audacious, they call it a venture, uh, which is essentially, you know, what is your moonshot that's going to change the world? And, you know, interestingly, I was sitting around looking at all the people all my classmates, and clearly they were much more accomplished than I I was, you know, road scholars and, you know, I don't know, I, people very successful in life. And I was lamenting the fact that uh, they were struggling with making an impact on the world. And I thought to myself, well, if they can't make an impact on the world, what, what hope do we have? And so um, I was reflecting on that. I was also reflecting on the fact that space was opening up, but it wasn't necessarily democratized. And so this was what was circling through my mind. And what I came up with was uh, the notion that the reason problems are intractable, the reason climate change and income inequality and mass migration and issues like that seem intractable is because we don't have the right perspective. And so I married kind of my perspective or my passion for space in wanting to get people to have that overview effect as coined by Frank White in a change in worldview uh, coupled that with my uh, ambition to democratize space and make sure that we got all kinds of humans to space. And uh, basically, that's how Space for Humanity was born. So its stated mission is to send 10,000 humans of all uh, nationalities and backgrounds to space over the next 20 years, hopefully sooner than that, but over the next 20 years, and um, really be a, a social movement around the power of space to transform humanity. Amazing. You know, speaking of transforming humanity, that's my life's purpose and vision as well as the world. So it's amazing. You know, one of the things we share uh, in terms of organizations, mine is uh, We the Planet, as well as Novus, and Space for Humanity, and how you guys came about to use the SDGs, which is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which not many space companies out there that I've seen embrace as an idea, even though, of course, it is a through line, but you guys actually went out and took the leap forward. Can you speak to how that happened, the story behind that? Sure. I'll spend just a few seconds on that, and then if it's okay, I'll pass the, the microphone to, to Rachel, Absolutely. because she really deserves the credit Absolutely. for it. But yep. you know, if, if you think about doing something as ambitious as what we're talking about, you need lots of capital to do that. And so we were thinking about how you, how you manifest that capital. And we were reflecting on the notion that the larger foundations in the world really want to see what's the value add here on Earth, right? As, as ambitious as space is, what is the benefit to Earth? And so we were trying to tie sending people to space with impact here on Earth. And we thought that that was the best platform. The UN Sustainable Development Goals were the best platform. It gave the uh, folks that we select as part of this mission to go to space enough latitude to tap into their passion, but yet um, enough tangibility where we could specifically measure what their impact was and ultimately raise more money from foundations because we were uh, more professional with the way we man manage the impact. 
Uh, with that, I'll. Thanks. Hi, so Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I'd love for you to introduce yourself because you're so extraordinary. Okay. And then perhaps we go into the story of the UN and the global goals. And Sounds perfect. Yeah. And yeah, um, I, I, I hopped in a couple minutes late. Um, so yeah, really glad to be here. Kunal, thank you. Dylan, good to see you. Um, so nice to see so many people that I know and love on this panel, like Frank and yeah, Sydney and yeah, Nancy, Laura. So good to see you all. Um, so int introducing myself, I am the executive director of Space for Humanity. Um, it sounds like you guys got a little bit into what Space for Humanity is and what we're doing. Um, but I've been, I basically had a, my, an overview effect. I'll, I'll bring that word in again, um, which I know we'll go deeper into later. An overview effect experience of my own when I was a teenager, um, watching Cosmos and seeing that reality of our existence, seeing that we all, we live on a planet in a, a seemingly infinite universe and and just what that means and um it completely transformed the way i viewed my place on this planet and the way i saw um just how how everything should and does function here um and yeah so so i guess that brings me to what dylan was talking about about how our most intractable problems are happening on a on a global on a planetary scale and so in order to address them, we must look at them in that way. And the UN SDGs provide a framework for us where like the people that we're going to be sponsoring to space, they could have an interest in any area. They could have an in any global challenge. It could be climate change. It could be addressing poverty. It could be addressing world hunger, education. Um, and, and when you take a global, a planetary perspective, it equips you to address these in new ways. And what the UN SDGs provide is, is as I said, a, a framework where we can address all these seemingly intractable problems and, and look at them from that planetary perspective and, and empower our people to really make a difference there. Amazing, amazing. And you know, um, uh, I'd, love, I'd love for both of you, Dylan and uh, Rachel to answer this. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of pushback sometimes, right? Uh, at least I've seen, uh, I'm one of the, outliers and maybe because I always was told as a child that I'm not from Earth, I'm some kind of space, alien from space that came into the family. And so I've always had a love for things beyond this Earth, uh, on Earth and beyond. Uh, but there's been some pushback around why space, who cares? You know, a lot of people seem to uh, not really uh, want to be part of the space uh, race per se. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most important uh, thing that uh, uh, matters here and now is that we create a force for good in the world. And I'd love for others to jump in as well, because Frank White, Nancy, Tice, you know, all of you have so much deep wisdom. But Rachel, I'd love for you to answer that question around why now, why space, why why transform using space innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, and I do, I think Dylan had to hop off, unfortunately, but I can definitely yeah. an answer and yeah, and Frank, I'm sure has lots to say as well. Um, so, so why space? How, how can we use space to transform the world? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a really big question. And, and it was someone, I mean, that's also, it kind of goes back to the first one about the UN SDGs and why are we bringing in the UN SDGs? Um, because so many people, when I, tell them about what I'm working on in space and, and about what's happening in space. They say, they say, why would we, why would we leave our planet when we have so many problems here that to address? And so they don't see the connection between addressing these challenges and going to space and how when we went around the moon and we saw the earth for the first time, seeing it from that perspective as a, as a marble in the sky is really what um, sparked the modern environmental movement. And w within three years, the Environmental Protection Agency was founded, Earth Day was founded, a number of the leading organizations in the environmental movement were founded. And this is all from seeing that perspective from space. And so, so why, yeah, why space is because it's, 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 it tells us the reality of our existence. 
and astronaut Ron Guerin, who were, um, he's on our advisory board. I was chatting with him the other day and he literally verbatim said, we are living a lie. Like we societally, we do not act like we live on a planet. We, we act like we have infinite resources and our priorities are around gaining money and power and, and everything that goes with that. And what if we actually lived with, like we lived on a planet? How would that change the way we interact with the environment? How would that change our priorities? How would that change the way that we treat each other? So, so that's, that's why space. It's because like with that perspective comes what, like, comes what we need in order to actually live sustainably on this planet as well as off planet. Can I add something? Please. <laughs> Um, I think that I've done, I've given many, many lectures all over the world. And this question is very common, why space? And I think that uh, I start correcting the question. I think that a good answer starts with a good question. <laughs> and it's not like why space? Because it's clear that with uh, satellites for telecommunication or weather or you know, climate um, uh, observations and so on, it's, it's needed. The question is why, to exp why humans should explore space? And this is a tiny bit of space exploration or, is, or, or our, act, our in terms of mankind or humankind activity in space. And then I had the, <laughs> the idea to create um, a kind of, uh, let's say, summary of, uh, well, people criticize that in space wrongly, it's not space, it's humans in space, and then take the money that's invested by space agencies all over the world, and the ones that have a tiny amount of money, I consider a tiny amount of money if compared to the, to the, to, to the rest of space exploration, uh, that is dedicated to human space exploration. And then if you compare that with all the corruption going on in the world, it becomes a tiny fraction of that. So the question is why humans should go into space? And I think that first, we are not spending um, money uh, in space uh, and causing problems here on Earth. That's not the, it's, it's a fallacy. It's, it's two, two, two truths connected wrongly. I think, first of all, and secondly, I think that this, this question also comes because it brings a psychological challenge for us. Because we do not question about the ocean exploration or any other thing that happened here on Earth. No, even, I don't know, some sports that are very expensive. We are not saying, oh, why do we have this type of sport if there are kids dying in Africa or you no know, corruption going on all over the world? The psychological issue, and this is something that I try to show to my audience, is that we are afraid of um, leaving the planet. Hmm. This is the question, this is the motivation of the question, not the money. It's not because if you, as I said, if you look, the money spent uh, in space uh, activities is extremely useful, even to solve the problems that people are concerned about when they ask the question. So to leave the planet is like when we leave home or we leave our parents or we leave... Uh, and this process, the psychological process for humankind is questionable, is a challenging. Emotionally, emotionally, it's very disturbing. And I think that it doesn't matter if you are from Asia, Africa, South America, United States, or wherever you are in the world, you are, you are safe here. You, are, we are, you have all our references here, our history is here. So to see people leaving the planet challenges more than a war, more than a natural disaster. Because even with that, we know how to deal. <laughs> we, we grew up, we develop uh, thinking, uh, somehow uh, living with this, uh, unfortunately, these things. No? So I believe that first the question should be re uh, rephrased. And then we compare the money that we spend in human space exploration with the 
problems on Earth and the, 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 the real reasons that cause the problems on Earth and uh, try to deal with the psychological issue of leaving the planet as uh, we are, as it is say, we say that, we, we verbalize that, we are leaving the cradle. And by saying it, it scares us, even if we don't say, even if we don't, it's not something conscious, but we are leaving the cradle. Yeah. Above all. Yeah, Frank, I would love your thoughts on that, because I know sure. you and uh, Nancy have uh, so much, I mean, you wrote the book on this. <laughs> yeah, I wrote the book on the overview check, that's true. <laughs> you know, so first of all, I just want to um, uh, say thanks for having me here with this great group of people, some of whom I know very well, like Rachel, others whom I'm just meeting, like, is it Thais? I, I don't know how to pronounce your name. It's Thais. Thais, okay. So I, I just want to support what uh, Rachel and Thais have said, but I am very familiar with what Rachel was talking about uh, because we have discussed it quite a bit. And I've also quoted Ron Guerin. Um, Hi. We are living a lie uh, in our current perspective because most of us have never left the planet and looked back at it. And we do not live like we're living on a natural spaceship. If the astronauts on the ISS lived the way we do, the ISS would no longer be in orbit. It would be gone. Um, and I think another thing is how we state it is very important, as I have said. If I changed it and I said, why should everyone experience the overview effect? It's quite a different thing. And I've actually said, I believe, experiencing the overview effect, which is seeing the Earth from orbit or the moon, um, it should be a human right, speaking of the UN. Everybody should get to see that perspective, not only for their own good, but for the good of the world. Because <clears throat> ultimately, if we had a critical of ma mass of people who understood the truth, then I do believe we'd be able to tackle these problems. And I totally agree with Dylan. We have a hard time doing it because we are not living the truth. And the truth, again, going back to why space, the truth is we can't go into space. We're in space. The Earth is a natural spaceship. We are exploring space every day because we're moving through the universe at a very high rate of speed. Um, and so we, we really do have to make the distinctions that were being discussed. What we're really talking about now is bringing the overview effect down to Earth, bringing that perspective to people. Space for Humanity is literally going to give people that orbital view. Other friends of ours are working on virtual reality ways of bringing people that perspective. And so the goal right now is not to leave the planet. It is to work on making the planet survivable for humanity right now. And I'm going to leave it right there and, and let other people speak. But there is another level I'd like to talk about, which is what Thais was talking about. I also believe some of us must leave the planet without leaving it behind. And yeah. that's a different discussion. It's so true. You know, what I say is, uh, Frank, I say we have to leave better stewards for the planet. And I think that is the worst disease. Everyone's talking about leaving the planet better off. No one's really talking about the leadership. I don't believe we have a resource or a technology problem. I believe we have a massive leadership and stewardship problem mm -hmm. on Earth where we're lying to each other, where we're covering up all these, uh, you know, uh, problems and on the fact that we need to fight climate change. But the truth is, even the way to fight climate change has become kind of like the antithesis to climate change itself, meaning a lot of noise, very little stewardship. I gotta hang up acting and speaking to the idea of transformation 
and very little leadership or action through through training as astronauts train for two to three years you know at a bare minimum seven if you want to go to the moon right uh i mean you've got to train that's the bare minimum minimum and i think the same has to happen with planet we have to train much harder to not let the planet leave the planet behind uh and i believe that i think uh, let's all come on camera because this format looks kind of strange even though we can uh you know egg uh we can always do post production so sydney ermi laura nancy nelson put on your cameras and let's have a discussion now around <laughs> why this matters and i wish uh, i could put on my camera kunal it is somehow i i i'm going to have to speak through my photo which looks a lot better than i do anyway oh that's not true i think uh, you and in, in the flesh is best but on the camera is second best thing yes your your yeah. photo devices sorry about that you know maybe try uh, uh, uh logging back in would that help i did that you do where the first thing even nelson seems to be uh maybe maybe you guys should switch to a mac <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> um, yeah, i'm on a mac desktop i'm on mm -hmm. chrome I've reloaded everything and right. it is what it is so I'm happy to to speak with you and and thank you for including me and hi Rachel it's nice to see you Well then you guys can be our ISS you know uh Listen you know it's on the way the world works these days and sometimes you get the real thing and sometimes you got to just do what you got to just do right Yeah exactly It means exactly. being struck by lightning at, on lift off on Apollo 12 <laughs> yeah. I I'd love to bring it back to Rachel. Rachel, uh you know this was a uh question for you and uh um you know and you Dylan and now you. Um where would where do you guys envision space for humanity being in uh 2 to 5 years or or even a decade? Let's let's put it let's put it on in 2 years, 5 years and a decade. Where do you feel space for humanity what's the massive transformative purpose and goal? Yeah. Well, I would say in 2 to 5 years we'll be flat we will be flying. Um I think that's a with the, with the progress the flight providers are making, um it looks like that will be the case. Um it's on it is on our strategic plan in that time frame. So, we're really really excited about that. Um and of course, it's not happening immediately. It's totally dependent on the technology. So, in the meantime, I mean what we're talking about with space for humanity is building a global movement. and building a global movement that says the way that we address these challenges are by looking at them from the perspective that they're happening on by using the space perspective. And so we're right now just like working to bring people on on board via all of our different means. We have events online, um people come and 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 attend and and, and learn about this. Um we're looking at ways that we can empower people to start making a difference with this perspective now. Um we share it via social media. Um so it's so in the meantime it's like making this something that people from all around the world can get behind. So so that's what we're working on and then and then working on just continuing to develop the programs, a leadership training program so the people who we send to space um are really empowered and making a difference when they return. Um and then and then in 2 to 5 years we'll be flying. Amazing. Amazing. Um I'd love to ask uh Sydney, I know you've worked in space for a while now and you started something that I was so fortunate to partner with last year called the New York Space Alliance and we hosted uh quite a quite a show on uh, the 50th anniversary of uh human kind landing on the moon with Frank White and Anusha Ansari and then we went to the UN the next day to find democratize the global goals as our ultimate moon spot on earth uh together and uh, uh, what's new since covid-19 city <laughs> how's the the world on in in space in new york took like uh shift, shifted and you know what's your focus Yeah no time flies and it's, it's amazing to be in a panel uh, with such a distinguished speakers some of them are heroes like Frank White and it's a great honor So the world has changed a lot at the same time some some things haven't changed right so our passion our appreciation for those who have given their lives uh, to enable humanity to go to space I think that uh, one perspective that I would like to share is the fact that uh, maybe it's uh, it's our responsibility as space advocates 
to try to frame the space message or the idea that deep space is important uh, from a from a perspective that will enable those who uh, still haven't uh, gotten the idea to really uh, come 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 and support our cause. And uh, in particular, what the New York Space Alliance is doing is trying to bridge the gap uh, between society, between investors, and bringing on board entrepreneurs, so that uh, those are the people that are creating the, the solutions and that uh, are not only impacting society with, through those solutions, but also that will be building the tools and uh, creating the ways for us to become a multiplanetary species. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, Nancy, would you like to share some thoughts around that? Well, yes. I mean, we had a conversation about the democratization of space. And I, I think that that corridor sort of opened in the early 90s with projects like Pete was working on the DCX that was a vehicle that could take us from California to Italy in, in 45 minutes, you know, you could do lunch in Paris and come home. And it was it was a, a vehicle that any payload could go in there from raspberries to people. And his thinking was, and he said this, there was a great thing done at the Smithsonian many years ago. And at the end of it, he talks about the moon. I've been there. Next time it's your turn. And opening up that opportunity for everybody to have the adventure. I, I, the, the way we work with that, we, the Conrad Foundation, is to invite young people, 13 to 18 from all over the world, to actually create solutions to the challenges in aerospace and in aviation. And so it becomes an inclusive endeavor with them. They already see the world without borders or boundaries, the same way that the guys who landed on the moon look back at Earth and it was this fragile blue and white marble that was suspended in a black velvet sky. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole hope of this idea of the democratization of space will really be realized with this Gen Z community of kids because they already see the world that way. They don't care where you live. They don't care your gender. They don't care your socioeconomic. They just are a global community of amazing young people who are purpose-driven innovators. And that's the the, um, the piece that we're trying to grow through the work that we do. So partnering with people like Rachel and your group, and Frank, I'm sorry, I, we've never met. So now you get to see my picture, but there you are. <laughs> I would love to, to meet you and, and yeah. have a conversation with you. So I, I think that the opportunity is so extraordinary right now um, and bringing that generation of young people who will be the next generation of explorers. Um, I, 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 has, I, I mean, I think they're explorers, they're not astronauts, they're explorers, they're people that are travelers. You know, we don't call ourselves, um, what, flight -anauts because we get on an airplane, we're just travelers, we, we are traveling. And so I kind of see it the same way. I mean, the astronaut training is very rigorous. And, and going to space is not an easy proposal. I mean, he trained for seven years to do the moonshot. So there are lots of risks involved. And so I think we have to give some very serious thought to how we think about the democratization of space. What are the tools and resources that are needed to educate a public about it? And how do we bring them in and, and not at them, but with them. How do we bring them in as participants in the adventure? So I'll stop there. Wonderful. Uh, speaking of next generation, I'm gonna welcome and invite my co-founder, Laura Moranaka, into the conversation to ask Rachel a couple of questions and uh, as well as the rest of the panel around education and space, which I know Ermi uh, is very passionate about. And uh, welcome, Laura. Fantastic and really well said, Nancy. We love the Conrad Foundation because you live your values in action every day and you really are training millennials, Gen Z, to become the next generation of explorers who will protect this planet, go out, 
explore and protect future planets where we may have a presence as humanity. I really, really want to ask uh, you, Rachel, with all the great work that Space for Humanity is doing, can you take us back to the beginning and share a little bit about your origin story with Dylan, Space for Humanity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think, I know, I haven't talked to, uh, Sydney, I don't think you and I chatted about this, and Nancy, I don't think you and I chatted about this, but I know Frank also has a really interesting or origin story. Um, it, and a lot of people that are doing this have like a single moment, that single, that single overview-esque experience that they had on earth that brought them to where they are today. And so I mentioned at the beginning that I watched Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos at a teenager, as a teenager, and I just had like this awakening experience. And I knew that I needed to do everything I could to share this perspective with other people. And um, a few years later, I was sitting in the, the audience of New Space 2017, a space conference, and I, had, I didn't know who Dylan was at the time. Um, and he went up there and he was a keynote speaker and he announced Space for Humanity. And, and he announced their mission of sending people to, sending regular people to space and, and using that to impact the world. And um, I was just sitting in the audience in awe like in disbelief that this was actually happening and this was actually a reality. And um, I immediately went and chatted with him afterwards. And um, a few months later came on as a volunteer after I, like I knew that we needed, I came on because I was like thinking about how we need to empower these people, the people that we send in the, in the biggest way possible to make a difference when they return. And, um, and so I came on as a volunteer and then my role grew since then. But the funny thing about Space for Humanity is, so Dylan, he created it as a project with the Aspen Institute. He was a Henry Crown Fellow. And, but at the same time, the idea got, if, from my understanding of it, got birthed from like a, um, like, like a note on a napkin, basically. Like he and our, first executive director, Matt Kuda, had a 45 second conversation and Matt Dylan was like, I have this idea. I'm not sure, like I want to do it. And you know, I have, and I'm not sure what to do next or some, something like that. And then Matt was Matt basically ran with it, created a website, um, made it a 501c3, came back to Dylan and was like, okay, let's do this. And um, yeah, and, and so every, that was 2017 and now it's 2020 and we're, we're growing really, really quickly. Yeah, you're growing exponentially and mm -hmm. so important really to bring this work to all communities, all people making space accessible because it's the most inspiring story really for, for the future of our human species. Um, would love to bring Ermi into the conversation because talking with everyone right now, you know, when we go beyond this planet, we're going to need the strengths of everybody. Doesn't just mean you are an astronaut or an astronaut in training. We need people who have the skills in nursing, doctors, psychologists, authors, really extraordinary people who represent the best of humanity to lead without fear or favor and to really transform the narrative around what it means to be an explorer again. Ermi, I want to give you the stage to really have a conversation about how can we inspire the next generation of explorers. Thank you, Laura. Thank you that I can be here and to share it as all with you. Um, yeah, um, all the child does not have to be motivated or inspired to discover and explore the world because they do that from the ground up, which is actually a very natural, inherent need of children. And what we as parents, teachers, or caregivers can do for children is 
it is the Mercedes Foundation through which they can develop and develop the individual skills. Which are, if, if, I'm, if I can, I would like to share five points um, to build a stable foundation. The first one is attachment. Attachment comes before education. A secure bond development from a child to their parents or caregivers is fundamental. And positive attachment experiences by sensitive parents to recognize, interpret, and mostly react appropriately to the needs of their children. Parents who help the children to verbalize the feelings, to regulate their emotions, enable them to experience a secure attachment experience as a stable foundation for the whole life. So they can benefit from a so-called positively um, shaped inner working model, which children can rely and build on in the de development. Second is give them the space and discover the world. Children learn by playing, exploring, researching, um, experimenting with all their senses, like touch, smell, taste, hearing, strength, the sense of movement, sense of balance. And they can do all of this best in the nature. Nature is a perfect environment which offers all incentives for their development. And third, joy and concern for what the child is experiencing. Parents or teachers who encourage, support, reflect and positively uh, reinforce the children in what they do and discover and take part in it. Accompany them on a journey. Support them only as much as they need the support to expand according to the development. And fourth, learn to endure frustrations and use them as a moderator by simply playing, building, for example, tree houses and designing together with children. They also learn to deal with when something does not work out or collapses and it has to be started again. They learn that a lot of things they need perseverance, passion, creativity, rethinking, and new beginning. And at some point, it will work. And these are the first experiences of the success. It also serves a valuable working model for the whole life. And at last, but not least, I could go on on <laughs> these points, um, a restful day sleep. The processing of experiences and the development of the brain take place during sleep. When falling asleep and sleeping, children need to feel secure. They need security and trust that their caregivers are always available when they are afraid or have nightmares, or if they just needed closeness or body contact to refuel and to be able to cope with the development tasks and challenges in everyday life. These are these points which I think it's important, but then right. more. So important, really, and fantastic message because Ermi has been on the front lines during COVID in Germany in the neonatal units with really at risk, tiny, tiny babies. And she lives her values in action, just like Nancy, really getting the next generation ready to be global citizens good stewards of the planet and explorers who really bring the best out of humanity. Frank, really want to shed some light and highlight your incredible trilogy of books. I have read the first two. I love The Overview Effect and The New Camelot and really want you to tell us what is your inspiration as an author who has sat with, had fantastic conversations with the best astronauts on the planet, best women and men who represent all nations? <clears throat> well, Laura, first of all, thank you for highlighting the three books. Uh, I think many people have heard of the first book, The Overview Effects, Space Exploration and Human Evolution, but I do think the other two books uh, complete the story up to now, and, uh, and each one has its own contribution, but they're all about the overview effect. Uh, just briefly, the inspiration for this writing 
started when I was very small. I've been interested in space exploration as long as I can remember. My cousin tells me that I was talking about it at the age of five and uh, telling her we were going to have to leave planet Earth someday. And I believe her, though I don't remember that. But my, my whole life up until the late 70s, early 80s, how do I get into the space movement without being an engineer, a scientist, a mathematician? And this is so true of so many people. That's why I emphasize it. I found Gerard K. O'Neill, who started the Space Studies Institute, and laid out a comprehensive plan for a really appropriate way for humanity to expand into the rest of the solar system and also to help planet Earth flourish. Gerard O'Neill is a person who hasn't gotten enough credit for what he's done, but Dylan Taylor has made a film about him, and I hope everybody will watch it because it's really important. But to make a long story short, I was obsessing with what would it be like to live in one of the O'Neill communities and always see the Earth from a distance. And I was thinking about it constantly. And on a cross-country flight, which had nothing to do with space exploration, I was looking out the window and I, I had a mild version of what I've come to call the overview effect, not the full version, but I saw there were no borders or boundaries and everything was interconnected and immediately projected that. And, and I said, you know, people living out between the earth and the moon would know that, you know, they wouldn't live the lie as Rachel said, they would know where we are in the universe and where the earth is and what the earth is all about. And I wanted to immediately interview people living in outer space permanently. But guess what? There weren't any. <laughs> he was living in outer space. And that's how I started interviewing astronauts. And I've interviewed 41 of them personally. I've read a lot of their books. And what comes through is that they are they point to what it would be like to live permanently in outer space. And some of them have lived almost up to a year, but they aren't quite what I was imagining because they were born on earth. They left the planet, they came back. So it's a little bit different experience. And yet it's a profound experience that we've been talking about of really seeing the earth and we shouldn't forget they see the cosmos in a way that none of us have seen it and when we think about the fact that fewer than a thousand people have had this experience actually closer to 600 that's why we're so inspired rachel and sydney all of us who are here we're so inspired for more people to have the experience not because they will then say, now I want to live on Mars, you know, not I want to run away from the Earth, but I want to bring back this experience to Earthlings. And I want everyone to know what I saw. And, you know, not one astronaut I've talked to, I, I always say, what did you get out of being an astronaut? Not one of them has said, uh, forget the Earth. I want to live on the moon. <laughs> None of them say that. Uh, every one of them gets a greater appreciation for our home planet. And finally, you asked me what inspires me. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll be able to interview everyone who's had the experience, but if I could, I would. Because every person I interview tells me something new. It's a very deep experience and mm -hmm. you really can't chronicle it by talking to one astronaut. You really, and oh, and incidentally, and I'll stop. Incidentally, I've started interviewing future astronauts, the people that Rachel is talking about, people not actually with Space for Humanity, but people who have a ticket on Virgin Galactic. 
And one of the wonderful things about it is that unlike a professional astronaut who's really going for completely different reasons, the people who are going now want the experience. That's why they're going. That's why they're mortgaging their house. You know, that's why they are saving their pennies. They want to experience the overview effect. And I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, uh, Frank, I have a question. If you were to interview, how many would be in that number of people that have experienced the overview effect? Well, in terms of direct experience, it's about 550. Wow. Wow. You wouldn't think that. You yeah. know, for a layman, I think there's only a small group of people, like a handful that have gone into space. Well, no. you know what's interesting about it? Um, I've started really researching everybody who's actually had the experience. And there, there are many astronauts who have not become well known. Uh, they went, they did a job, they completed their experience and and they've come back and they are doing things within their community and they are having an impact. But uh, we are so focused on those who've gotten a lot of attention that we don't realize that. And it's interesting, Kanal, when I ask the question to an audience, how many people do you think have been in outer space? I get 25 I get 10,000, <laughs> I get all kinds of numbers because it's not something we think about every day. I think there's a very good reason for that, Frank. Yeah. The guys who went to the moon, that's deep space. That was 240,000 miles from Earth. The guys that, and women who are flying on ISS, that's low Earth orbit. It's a big difference in the, in the entire scope of space, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah, there are 12 guys that walked on the moon. And by the way, Frank, were you ever able to interview my late husband, Pete? Oh, I lost the last piece of what you said. I said, were you ever able to interview my late husband, Pete? Um, unfortunately, he left the planet permanently in 1999. So I didn't know yeah. if you ever had that, that shot. I wish I would had that privilege, Nancy. No, I haven't. Well, and, and to your point, I, I think, you know, each of them that came back from the moon, and I'm very honored that I've known each of them, um, they all had a different experience, but wonderment was central to it to see Earth as this little fragile blue and white marble, which they don't see from ISS. They see the outer edge of the atmosphere, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary. Man, I'd love to take a ride, but, um, <laughs> but, but I think there's such a, that's why I think you get that response that, you know, like Kunal, there's only just a few people. Well, yeah, there were only a few that went to the moon, but the number of people that have been in space in low earth orbit is very large and growing. Um, which is extraordinarily interesting, and the long duration space flight experiments that like Scott Kelly and such, um, that just fascinates me. I, I was part of a study that the Institute of Medicine did on ethics and standards for long duration and exploration space flight. And it's creating all sorts of different and unique experiences for these guys and women and boy, the experience is very different to the human body for the male and the female. And now they're finding all sorts of things that uh, they didn't know about before, which is hugely important as we start thinking about colonizing the moon and, and lunar outposts and then Mars missions and such. So I think we're in a very interesting time of transition. Yeah. And the Space Force, oddly, has not come into this conversation, which I find interesting as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that, may I ask? Yeah, no, I love uh, Frank as well as uh, Sydney and Thais and whoever else is uh, familiar with Space Force to speak to that. I'd, I'd like to pass the floor to someone else. I've had a lot of air time. Uh, I do <laughs> have a <laughs> <opinion. laughs> do, do you think Space Force will exist once the new administration takes a uh, 
takes place, or will it actually be a thing, or will it be changed into something else? Something, I don't know. Yeah, something was in my email today that I have to, I can't, I can't refer to it because I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was about Space Force, which is why it was plugged into my brain today. I think it's such a great question. It's fantastic. Sydney, Thais, yes. Ernie, what do you think of Space Force? I, I will follow up, but I want to hear from you all. Yeah, no, I'm happy to share uh, my personal views. Uh, Space Force, sorry. Uh, now, the Space Force, I think it's um, something that uh, had been in discussion uh, for a long time. And when you think, think about uh, the military, we tend to associate it with uh, wars, and uh, we sometimes overlook the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, military investment on some of the technologies that we already see it impact our, uh, our, our uh, lives. Uh, the fact that, that we have a space program is directly related to, to those efforts. Uh, so if I, I mean, if I could put a positive spin on Space Force and uh, something that uh, uh, we experienced uh, through the New York Space Alliance uh, is the fact that uh, if anything else, there has been investment in startups and in, in innovation uh, because the idea is that through Space Force, you can accelerate uh, the development of uh, new technologies. Of course, the use of technologies, I think it's something that we, we can discuss it, right? And, and, and it's, it's very different to talk about Space Force from the militarization of space, which I think it's uh, an even more uh, uh, hard issue for us to discuss. So there's an article in Space News today about Space Force and um, per your, so I just refer you to Space News today if you wanna see the article. It's too long for me to quote it. But and um, basically, it's going to include a mix of legacy and non-traditional procurement offices, whatever that means, and and really trying to promote innovation, um, which the military takes a very long time to innovate because of evidence-based and it's like medicine um, in this country, not all countries, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I just referred to the Space News article for today, and it's quoting General John Raymond, saying the Space Systems Command will include a mix of legacy and non-traditional procurement offices. Mm. He said, I think you're going to see an organization that has disruptive innovators, prototypers, and more traditional. The goal is to have unity of effort reduce duplication, reduce cost, and increase speed. That sounds like Dan Golden, faster, better, cheaper, his whole <laughs> mode the whole time he was administrator. Anyway, take a look at the article. It may or may not be interesting to you. Frank, do you have thoughts? I thought Thais had something to say. Yeah, Thais, um, I think you were speaking to uh, this idea I think that we should be very careful <laughs> because knowing the history of mankind or humankind, we know what we can do when you have a weapon in our hands. Yep. It is um, something that can motivate the development of uh, technology. Many wars have done that, and we have very good examples in medicine, uh, terrible examples, but it, there was a revolution of knowledge based on... Um, uh, on some wars, you know, that uh, uh, used humans as guinea pigs. Yep. So uh, I, I just don't want it to be the, the uh, I step in the wrong direction, giving the wrong message to allies. I think that it was a huge step to have an international space station. I think that when you talk about democratization of space and the peaceful use of space, we are going the right direction bringing everybody globally. Uh, you know, it's not one country or two or three countries, it's the man, uh, humanity exploring, leaving the planet, exploring the moon, back to the moon, uh, or one day going to Mars. As a space physiologist doctor, I think that we are uh, 
possible a couple of decades, bef in my opinion, um, uh, a way for to go to Mars safely. Unfortunately, the human body is extremely is a machine that's extremely complex, and uh, uh, so I uh, I think that we need to be just careful if we go to if we emphasize the militarization of space, not just by one country, but many countries, because one can bring the other, and then there is always a justification or an explanation. Um, so that's my 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 point of view. I am a, I'm Brazilian. I live in London. I'm, a, I'm an academic. Uh, I worked many years in medicine here on Earth <laughs> and uh, terrestrial medicine, let's say. And then I shift to academia. Now I'm uh, shifting again to uh, to the business side of space, but keeping my academic activities, I'm a uh, linked to King's College in London where I did my PhD and um, to other universities, universities in Europe and uh, also here in Brazil and so on. And my, 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 my main goal is to produce knowledge to help the, with the development of um, space life science, space physiology, space psychology, all areas related to humans, uh, human space exploration and make it global and very inclusive and very diverse and uh, ideally also very peaceful. I think that space can, can give this, um, can be this tool, you know, not just because of the overview effect that's very important and I agree, you know, with Frank, it's, it's it is a, it's a must. Uh, I, I wish 7.5 billion people could have that. We might have a very different world, but uh, it, also in the way that we design our programs and uh, and have this global attitude. It's interesting. Just uh, just as an example, I I had the opportunity in 2000 to see the first, at least for me, the first time that I saw a kind of panel. You know, I was in a congress, a meeting in uh, Greece. And for the first time, I could see the Russians, the Americans, the Europeans, the Japanese together. In a, in a, you know, it, it was quite a shock for me because I was coming from that era of very, uh, very military uh, design of space. I'm a woman, I'm a civilian, I'm Brazilian, so I had everything against me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was there, and uh, uh, when I was in meetings, because I am Brazilian, because I am a woman, uh, I, I was in these space medicine meetings, and I was by myself because I didn't have any friends or colleagues with me. So I was jumping from the Russians to the Americans to the Germans. To, <laughs> no, I was like a, a pig in the middle. No, I didn't know where to go. <laughs> and um, but they were not together. They were not like united. They were like in groups, small groups here and there. That's why I could basically jump from one group to the other. And then for the first time in, in Greece, I could see everybody there. And then it was the beginning of the International Space Station was with this more, let's say, uh, collaborative exploration of space. And I'm very much in favor of that. I think that you need to be ambitious, but not destructive. We need to be uh, collaborative and not competitive. I mean that if you could see, if you could be like that, it would be much better. So that's my only concern. If that could be used against humanity somehow, or to be a way to distort yeah. this um, construction of a peaceful exploration of space. Couldn't agree more. Laura and Ermi, I'd love for you guys to sh chime in before Frank has the last word. Absolutely. This is really a fantastic conversation worked out fortuitously because we have Germany, Brazil, the United States, Japan, well represented here. Brazil. I really want to put out, yes, <laughs> the question to everybody from India to outer space. How can space really teach the next generation about international cooperation exponential leadership as we go into 2021 and sustainability on the planet. Now, please, anyone. Try and Ernie, jump, jump in. Oh, I'll jump, I'm going to jump because I got to jump off. So, okay, Nancy. <laughs> so, 
I believe that the collaboration is and innovation and certainly the entrepreneurial mindset is really the key to the sustainability of humankind. Going to space is a great way to understand the planet we live on and doing it collaboratively, especially with, you know, I work with young kids and so I just see their energy, their excitement about it and their ability to collaborate is almost a priori, it just happens because of the way they live and think. It's a huge opportunity for humanity to actually become humane mm -hmm. and to really understand each other as part of inhabitants of this little tiny blue and white marble. And man, sustaining this thing is everything. <laughs> Thank you for including me. I apologize yes. for my little phone making noise. I have to jump and have a call. Very nice to meet all of you. And thank you for the great work you're doing. It's very exciting. And Kunal, thank you for including me. Thank you. thank you for your voice and your, hopefully next time your face. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I look better in the picture. <laughs> Thanks yeah. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nancy. We'll have you back. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ami, we'd love for you to share value of education to create the next generation of leaders? Yeah, I think what the what what's very important is um, yeah, how amazing and less space is around us. No limits. It doesn't belong anybody. Out there is so much compared to our world with different countries, cultures, problems. Um, it doesn't matter where you live or whatever your color or your skin is. And um, we all together have the same sun, the same moon, the same planet about us. And we all, including all the kinds of life, plants, animals, living under the same space. So what they could should learn is um, we should work together to protect the space and our planet. And we all have the responsibility to do that. Beautiful, Ermi. Let's go to Brazil, Sydney, and Dice. I think that was calling on you, Sydney. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, Thais, great to see a fellow Brazilian. Too. Yes, no, thanks so much for organizing this incredible panel and very inspiring. When you talk about space, the inspirational aspect, I think, is, has been brilliantly covered by Frank. I also believe that uh, with inspiration, there is a call, call to action. Uh, uh, and, the, and the aspirational side should be part of uh, what we uh, what we should also uh, focus on as we move forward. Uh, I, I really like uh, RBGs. There's a very famous quote from uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that uh, most of you probably know. And uh, she says that uh, fight for the things that you care about, uh, but do it in a way that they will lead others to join you. And this is maybe the message that I would like to, uh, for us to, to reflect on is that uh, it is very important to put a message out. Right? It's also very important to frame it in a way that others would join us. Mm. True. Thank you so much. Thais. Well, first of all, thank you very much for including me in this uh, discussion. I think that we should have more uh, discussions like that. Uh, very useful <laughs> to brainstorm and to share experiences. Uh, I, as I said uh, before, I'm now uh, starting my, let's say, my business career, my third phase of my professional career. And uh, in Nov Nov Space is uh, basically a think tank company, and I I create that basically uh, mirror, uh, as a reflection of all my experience. So it is uh, it's, um, it. Um, uh, has this um, idea, this um, ethos uh, called the space without borders. And when you call that space without borders, not just the overview effect that's no geographic borders, but no borders whatsoever in terms of gender, race, uh, uh, faith, religion, um, language, and, and so on and so forth. So it's really to bring mankind together. It's a very ambitious idea. And I know that I'm going to have many issues 
but I, I, I decide that the, the best way to contribute, not with just the future generations, um, but even with my generations and the older generations that are still in power, is to bring a, a, this different perspective of a very global, inclusive, diverse and disruptive company. Uh, it's it's interesting this the site you're gonna enjoy i think we have we, we have the normal business activity to other companies and uh, profiting here and there but there is also education and outreach and uh, but above all is the vision the vision of nova spaces what i think that is needed i have uh, suffered all, all my life for being a woman for being a civilian and for being a latin american um, lady <laughs> so uh i think that i'm i'm trying to to give a different perspective uh, it's it's my personal overview uh, effect <laughs> Tice, that is a wonderful message i'm a latin american woman too we definitely need more women and artemis is a step in the right direction Frank, really, you've blessed us all with the overview effect. Really, we'd want you to have the last word as we're going into 2021 and all the hope for a bright new year. Well, I'd say a few things. Um, first of all, I would say that the heroes of the story are the astronauts. Um, all I've done is chronicle their heroic activities. And I really mean that because anybody who gets on top of a rocket and allows themselves to be flung into orbit or to the moon, they're risking their lives. And they, they are bringing back what we would call sacred knowledge. Uh, it's part of the hero's journey. And they want to share this perspective with us. So we really need to honor what they've done and to absorb it and bring it into our, our everyday lives. And I want to also say that because of what they've done and what they've shown us, I'm extremely hopeful for the human future because I believe they represent who we are and who we can be when, when we are given the opportunity. Um, and finally, I would say, just building on what Ernie has said and Nancy, we need to share this message with people who are older and middle-aged and in their 20s. But the future is really going to lie with the young people, the children. And as Nancy said, they've got it already. They've got it. They have a planetary perspective. They know we have to sustain the planet. They know the things that we're trying to communicate to them with the overview of that. And so I think one of our big tasks that we don't think about very often or not enough is not to give those young people something, but to keep them from losing what they have. And if we can do that, I think we'll be fine and the human future will be really quite extraordinary. And uh, we're about to embark, embark on a great adventure, and I just think we need to share our joy at that with the whole world. This is an extraordinary panel. We really want to express gratitude to everybody for making the time to have such an extraordinary conversation. Kunal and Sydney and myself are in New York City really has been wonderful to build the chapter here. Lots to do in 2021 together. We will see everybody soon. Kunal, Sydney, do you want to hand it back to Fabrizio with thanks and lots of love to Germany? Yeah, thank you guys uh, as the ambassadors for, uh, actually three ambassadors because uh, Laura and Sydney are also ambassadors for Singularity University. Uh, New York City, and uh, we want to a thank our partners in impact and transformation from outer space, Fabrizio, and I don't know uh, where you're from, Pedro, but thank you guys for everything. Um, I guess Pedro sounds uh, Brazilian, or is it Spanish? I'm not sure. 
Portugal. 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 Oh, yes. One of my favorite countries. I'm from a good place in the country. The United Nations is there with uh, Secretary General of uh, uh, Portugal. So, uh, yeah, I would uh, really uh, first and foremost thank all of our speakers, Frank, Harry, Sydney, Ermi, for being with us. It's been a special pleasure and honor. Despite the technical issues, I believe taking back the love of the family, the family of the family. Um, but um, good to next to the uh, panel, and I, I am honored that I have the uh, fortune of uh, sharing the stage with such uh, legends on, on the panel. Thank you, Kanal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Laura, for handling. Bye, Laura. Thank, Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. So we will have to 